All right, everybody, this is Ross. I want to talk to you guys about melons today. I'm, I've been really excited. Ever since I went to Japan, um, I was at a ryokan there, and we stayed uh, overnight, and we got a really awesome dinner. It was like a seven- or eight-course meal, and they kept trucking out all these interesting little dishes to us, and it was, it was great. It was tasty. And then the very last thing for dessert was a melon, and they gave us one little slice of... Uh, a musk melon that resembles a uh, honeydew, although there's no such thing as honeydew. There's either cantaloupes or musk melons. The cantaloupes have a, a, a smoother outside uh, edge to them, uh, like a pumpkin that have ridges in them. And then a musk melon has the netting on the outside. So a musk melon is what we got that was green on the inside. And we were just blown away. I was absolutely blown away. I was surprised as well to just see the fact that that's what we got for dessert and it was just unbelievable um so i've been ever since that moment of visiting japan i've been on this melon journey guys to try and grow homegrown melons up to that standard because i feel like at least here in the united states we are deprived we don't even necessarily know what great food is unless we go to a really high-end restaurant you know uh growing food at home is always so much far superior than what you can get at the store and not just for you know being able to pick it at the right time but also because of the genetics and i have a feeling because melons are very expensive in japan i mean each melon there guys at a base price one melon is ten dollars but most fruit there in japan is quite expensive so you usually in that culture you would end up giving somebody these melons or, or fruits as a gift. And they're grown to the highest standard possible, to perfection. And depending on how great they are, how great they're grown, they get a larger price. And um, that's exactly what goes on with these melons. But it's not just them growing to the highest quality possible, but they're also growing superior genetics. And I have a feeling whatever the melon varieties are that they, they have, they must be similar or superior to the, to the melons I have here. So I have really my first homegrown melons that I've ripened to perfection. Uh, we've sort of failed for the most part last year. This here is a variety called Sarah's Choice. And it is a musk melon, as I said, it's got the netting on the outside. Uh, this one you harvest at full slip and it was perfectly ripe. I've been tasting these over the last couple weeks. It's pretty good but not Japan quality. And then there's also here I have a variety called Savor, which both of these are hybrids, by the way. We'll get into that in a minute. But this is Savor. It's a Charente type cantaloupe. And uh, as I said, cantaloupes have the ridges on the back. They have stripes um, where the ridges are. And then also it's smooth. The skin is smooth. They're absolutely beautiful this particular Savor melon, these Sharon Tay type cantaloupes. And they have a really good reputation for being exceptionally flavored and fragrant and uh, some of the best melon varieties you can grow. Now this one, because Sharon Tay type melons are a bit difficult to grow, I decided, and really melons I failed over the last year, I decided to grow hybrids this year. And I read a book by uh, How to Grow Great Melons, I think it's called, by Amy Goldman. And we talked about this for a couple of our videos now, even an episode of Fruit Talk that we did. But in uh, Amy Goldman's book, she has so many hybrid, or so many heirloom melons in there, I'm sorry, that are magnificent, that just uh, have great information on there about them. Uh, they even have some tasting notes, things about their bricks content. Um, all kinds of great information. So what I did last year, if you guys recall, we did a video last year. We talked about growing like 15 or 18 different varieties of heirloom melons that I got from the book that I thought would be great additions to my yard. And we could grow them, figure out which one was the best, whichever tastes the best and performs the best. Excuse me, guys. That's the one we're going to keep. But they all got Fusarium wilt. If you guys remember last year, we had them all up here. 
and we had them trellised up vertically. As you can see, my tomatoes are uh, in the same exact way. They're growing vertically. And they are grown then in that, sing that, that style of a single stemmed plant. And you have little side shoots that come off where the, the flowers form and get pollinated. And it's a really great way of growing melons. Um, in fact, if you wanted to do it very densely and you wanted to grow a lot of melons in a smaller space, that's actually how the Japanese growers do it, is they grow them vertically. And I think this is going to kind of segue into what I really want to get at in this video, because after trying these varieties here this year, I, I really wanted to have a successful harvest. So we, we got these two hybrid varieties instead of the heirlooms. And the reason I went with the the hybrids is simply because of disease resistance. And the whole reason I failed with this vertical melon system last year is not that I didn't necessarily know what I wasn't doing. It's just that we had crazy cucumber beetle pressure last year. And we had therefore had a lot of fusarium wilt. And this year I haven't seen much cucumber beetle damage on any of my cucurbits. And I think there's a reason for that that I've talked about in other videos. Uh, namely silica or silicon that we've we've sprayed on these plants um, and then I think that's kept mostly the cucumber beetle away for at least the beginning part of our season so um, whether or not that's true or whether or not it has something to do with the fact that they're hybrids and they have just superior genetics in terms of their disease resistance I was able to get a really great harvest this year versus last year I wasn't. So that's kind of the issue I'm, I'm seeing now is that I'm picking these melons at perfection. I'm tasting them, but they're just not that great. They really do, in my opinion, taste a lot similar to something you'd get at the store. They're, they're slightly better than a store-bought melon here in the United States, which is pretty sad to me. It's, it's upsetting to me, because uh, I put in a lot of work for this a lot of time to then only find out that I think a lot of this has to do with the genetics. So next year what we're going to do, we're going to try to find, if we can, we're going to try to find something that is disease resistant. Maybe we'll try growing them vertically one more time using the silica spray, again the Dynagrow Protect to help them with the cucumber beetle. That I assume would definitely help. and. Uh, We'll try to grow them vertically, and we'll also try to find heirloom melon varieties that are not just high in bricks, but also very disease resistant. We'll be more careful, I think, with what varieties we choose and maybe the amount of varieties we choose. Maybe I won't do 15 varieties. Um, so I think that's a pretty decent compromise, at least a step forward towards succeeding and getting a part of Japan back into my life. Um, now, why is it though, I think this is really what I wanted to get at in this video, is what are the reasons, the real reasons why I have not had so much bricks, high enough bricks in those melons that we just harvested? Because you can measure the bricks on any of these fruits guys, the amount of soluble sugars that are in the fruits is going to determine largely the quality uh, but also the sugar content. So if we're having a higher bricks, normally we're going to get a better tasting fruit. And for me, I think a lot of it comes down to the genetics, as we talked about. Also, this particular bed, this area here, was quite heavily shaded for most of the season because we had our corn here. We had a, basically a three sisters garden, if you guys have been following along with our garden videos. We had 10 foot tall corn here about two weeks ago. So I cut the corn back. As I cut the corn back, the melons were pretty much then ripening up. And the corn essentially was shading out this whole area. Now in the front, we had potatoes and we harvested the potatoes sometime in June and July. And as soon as I harvested them, the melons sort of took over that area, which was great. That's exactly what I wanted, but maybe they're not getting a whole lot of sunlight or enough sunlight. Maybe there's not enough uh, photosynthesis to then give the, the melons enough carbohydrates to then sweeten those fruits. I don't know. Um, so there's a lot 
to consider here. Now, there's one other thought I have. Actually, two other thoughts I have. One is in, in the water. So in terms of water, it's been a relatively dry year. And it only started really raining as of about three weeks ago. We started to get a lot more rain. Prior to that, it was a, quite a dry year. And usually, with most fruits, guys, I, don't, I can't say this definitively with melons, but I'll tell you this, is that if you dry farm or deficit irrigate your melons, you don't give them a whole lot of water, you give them just enough to be happy and healthy, you will see a higher bricks. You will see sweeter fruits. If you overwater, the bricks will decrease. This is a fact in most fruits. Now, uh, it could be slightly different in melons, and I'm sure a lot of people are gonna say, oh, well, the melon's so juicy, it needs a lot of water, right? But I don't necessarily know if that's true. I think there's a, a certain amount that the melon needs. When you achieve that certain amount, any more in excess is going to lower the bricks of that fruit. And I, I'm pretty sure I've read I figured out from the, how the Japanese grow their melons is that they don't overwater their melons either. Now, what they do actually is grow them vertically in greenhouses. So that was sort of our big little thing here that we wanted to do is that as grown as a single stem plant, um, also grown um, in disease-free soil, they actually fumigate their soil, believe it or not. Um, if that's the right word, but they heat up their soil to a very high temperature to actually kill any wilt that might be in the soil. Um, and then they uh, grow them vertically. I think they don't water them a whole lot. And then also what they do is they have maybe one or two melons or not a whole lot of melons per vine. Um, so that way the energy is being concentrated into one or two fruits. Additionally, they are pruning out the lower leaves to let the sunlight actually hit the melon. There's a lot of care that goes into these things. There's a lot of uh, information you could learn on these melons. So I think we're going to have to step up our game here because just growing them the way that we did this year, although successful, very successful, I'm harvesting quite a bit. In this patch here, guys, is about two watermelons that I planted. Uh, there's more than that because I planted, you know, uh, I didn't thin out the plants. There's about maybe six watermelon plants. And then I planted about three different locations here of the musk melons and the cantaloupes. So we're getting a lot of production here. The, melon, the watermelons are a bit further behind the musk melons and the cantaloupes. And those are actually heirlooms, not hybrids. But overall, they're actually starting to come in as well. And I'm not too concerned with the production because the production's been great. I have a few more Savoir melons that are coming in around here. There's another Sarah's Choice back there. So, you know, the production's great. But, you know, it's nice to have this food and not have to go to the store and buy it. But it's just marginally better than the store quality. And for the effort that I put in to grow these and to care for them, it's just not... Um, it's not paying off. So uh, anybody out there has any tips or uh, wants to give me some great information on getting sweeter melons, love to hear it because that's my goal here is to get a melon that is uh, highly fragrant, very high bricks and has a complex flavor that also performs beautifully well here in my horrible climate. So, all right guys, thank you so much here for watching this one. I hope you loved my uh, my melon story at the Ryokin and me talking about Japan. It's a great place. Highly recommend it, guys. We'll see everybody soon. All right, hit that subscribe button. Check out our other videos on melons because we've been doing quite a bit now. So take care, guys.